Hi there, everybody. Um, welcome to the first review of the semester. So we're going to go through and do all the questions on the practice exam. Join me, won't you? Although I suppose you already have. Let's do this. So first we have a question about functional groups. Fun with functional groups, as I like to call it. Um, also, sorry about the resolution here. I'm not sure why, but um, my screenshots don't look very crisp. Anyway, regardless, let's do this. So here we have a carbon-carbon double bond. This means that we are looking at an alkene. Okay, question one, done. Well, question two, question one is the honor statement. Question three, what is the name of this functional group? All right, so here we have a carbon connected to an oxygen, connected to another carbon. So we have this kind of R, oh, and then R prime. Remember, R is just any sort of extension of an organic molecule. So this is dun, 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 an ether. Okay, up next. What is the name of this functional group? Now this is an alcohol. So alcohols are what we get when we have um, a hydrocarbon chain and then we have an OH coming off of it. And just for posterity's sake, let's look at this functional group down here as well. I'm gonna label this. This is, well, let me tell you, this, there aren't really too many great mnemonics for um, functional groups. You just kind of have to practice with them and learn them. This one though, I do have a mnemonic for. So let me introduce you to um, a friend of mine. That friend is a hydrogen named Al. I promise this is going somewhere. Kind of wildly tacky. So here's Al. I'm Al, says Al. When we draw the skeletal structure, do we need to include Al though? So we could draw this like this instead, right? Because we don't need to draw a hydrogen attached to a carbon in a skeletal structure. What happened to Al? Well, Al did hide. Zing! Oh, this is an aldehyde. Other than that, you more or less have to, at least I'm not aware of many great mnemonics for these things. Okay. Oh, actually it was the next question anyway. Uh, this is an aldehyde. There we go. And then we're returning back to the first structure we looked at. What is this functional group? This is an amine. Amines are what we get when we have carbon nitrogen single bonds and no immediately adjacent carbonyls, okay? Specifically, this is a tertiary amine because it's attached to three carbons, but we don't need to include it. We just need the functional group, which again is an amine, okay? Up next, which of these conformations is more stable? So we have here two different chair molecules. Which one is more stable? Well, that's going to be, remember, when we have the chair conformation, anything that is axial creates steric interactions with the adjacent substituents. So what I mean by axial is anytime you see a vertical line coming off of, um, off of, our chair conformation. So chair conformation kind of looks like a lightning bolt, like so. And there's always gonna be in a cyclohexane ring, um, six axial groups and six equatorial. And the axial ones are easy to recognize because they're completely vertical. So there's three above and three below. Whereas equatorial, have more of a, they're kind of like splayed out a little bit. And we don't have to draw in hydrogens, but if you wanna know what equatorial ones look like, they kind of have this sort of general shape to it. The key to analyzing stability here though, is to think about how axial substituents interact with other axial ones. Because what happens when you have a large axial substituent, let's say for example, this um, isopropyl group here, it is going to actually interfere from a spatial standpoint with other um, axial hydrogens. So the larger this group is, 
the bulk here is the more of these steric interactions we have. And steric interactions create a higher energy situation. So long story long, we want larger groups to not be axial. We want them to be equatorial for a lower energy, more stable molecule. So in terms of these, what is going to be the bulkier? Well, the isopropyl group is, which means we want it to be equatorial in order for a lower energy, more stable. So in this one, the isopropyl group is equatorial. The isopropyl is a lot bulkier than the methyl group. So the methyl group will create some steric interactions, raise the energy a little bit, but not nearly as much as the isopropyl. Okay, so again, the key to these is we want bulky substituents. to be equatorial for a more stable molecule. And again, that is on account of the sterics. Okay, up next, we want to name this molecule. Okay, sounds good. So we can either recreate this in more of a traditional structure or we can kind of go around um, and count out our carbons. So this is, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Okay. We have an isopropyl group on one of them and we have a methyl group and make sure to count. So that methyl group is, let's see here, one, two, three carbons away. So it's on the other side of the molecule. All right. So now when naming, again, we want to consider that we have an isopropyl group and we have a methyl group. So when prioritizing these, there are no alkenes or alkynes to prioritize. And which, regardless of which one we start, it's going to be one for substituted. So what we're gonna do is go with alphabetical order here. And remember I, Isopropyl is the only substituent that we use the I for. Otherwise, like if something is like dimethyl, we would use the M from methyl. If something is tert-butyl, we use the B from butyl, et cetera. So putting these in alphabetical order, isopropyl is gonna come first, methyl is gonna come second. And the parent name is just gonna be cyclo, cyclohexane. Okay, so the full name, let's number these. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the full name then is going to be one isopropyl, four methyl, and remember we're going to put um, dashes in to offset these, and then we're going to go right into the parent name, cyclohexane. One isopropyl for methyl cyclohexane. Okay. All right. Here we have two different Newman projections of um, the same molecule. So again, the first question asks what these are. So these are Newman projections. And the idea with a Newman projection is you basically look at um, two carbons head on. So you line those two carbons together. And if we're looking at this, the way that we interpret a Newman projection is we have something in the front. So the front carbon is going to be just a little circle and the back carbon is represented by a larger circle. Then we draw our substituents on it. So whatever we have on the front one, and I'm gonna switch colors over to green for the back one. And then we have whatever is on the back carbon. So looking at this, we have our front carbon like so. So I'm going to try to draw this out, not try to draw this out, I'm going to draw this out. We have one carbon, the front carbon. We have the back carbon, I'm going to make pink. So those are connected to each other. And then what's coming off of each of those carbons? 
Well, the front carbon has a methyl group coming off of it that we can see right here. So there's a CH3 coming off of it. And the back carbon also has a carbon coming off of it. We have right here, like so. And so there's a total of the rest of the things on there are hydrogens. So each of these has two hydrogens coming off of it. So I'll draw those in as well, just for posterity's sake. And we can see these are methyl groups. So H, 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 H. This is none other than the molecule. There's four carbons and this is butane on account of the four carbon chain. Okay, so um, when we're looking at these, what projections, or not what projections, how are these organized? They are organized. I don't care about my backup software. Leave. Okay. So when looking at a Newman projection, the idea is we can see if our groups are aligned with each other or if they are offset. If they are offset, we call this staggered. If they are aligned with each other, we call it eclipsed. You know, quite literally when something aligns, it eclipses, right? Like if you have a lunar eclipse, the um, Earth, Sun, and Moon are lined up, so you can't see, or a shadow goes on the Moon. Same thing with substituents. If they're aligned with each other, they're eclipsed. Okay, and eclipsed is going to be higher in energy, aka less stable, remember. Lower energy is more chill, is more stable. Higher energy, less stable, okay? So this one's going to be lower in energy. And that's always going to be the case for our purposes. If we have bulky substituents, um, well, it's always going to be lower energy to have these staggered. And then just like the sterics that we looked at with the cyclohexane molecule, um, the bulkier the substituents are when they're eclipsed, the higher energy things become. Okay. Up next, which of the following molecules is a constitutional isomer of octa-2,5-diene. So let's draw octa-2,5-diene. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons in it. And I'm going to number these carbons just to make this a little bit easier. And hence, and hence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And since it's 2,4-diene, I'm going to draw in some double bonds. Um, sorry, it's 2,5-diene, so I'm going to make a double bond there, and we're going to make a double bond right here as well. Okay, great, well and good. Now at this point, we can either count out all the hydrogens if we want to get the formula. We don't necessarily need to do that, though. We can use degrees of unsaturation instead. So either way works perfectly fine. If you want to count, count the number of hydrogens, you can. The formula is going to be C8 by virtue of oct. And then it's going to be H, there's two degrees of unsaturation. So if this was just a regular alkane, um, the formula would be twice as many hydrogens as carbon and then plus two. So an alkane would be C8H18, but with the two degrees of unsaturation, the two double bonds, this ends up getting kicked down to C8H14. And if you count that out, you will end up getting that as well. Now then, I can either calculate out the number of hydrogens in each of these, or I can use degrees of unsaturation to answer it as well. Okay, so looking at these answers, this first molecule here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight carbons, okay, that's promising. This has two degrees of unsaturation. It's got a ring, which is a degree, and it's got a double bond eight carbons, two degrees of unsaturation, we have our winner. Ding, 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 ding. Um, all the other ones, so this one, if you count it out, will be C8H18 as well. And remember, constitutional isomer means same number of each atom, just different connectivity. So if we look at the other ones, this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. So seven carbons and two degrees of unsaturation, which would be C7. Oops, I wrote C7H18 up here, and then H14. 
Um, so this would be C7H12, doesn't match. Um, and then the other ones don't have the right numbers of degrees of unsaturation. This one has zero degrees of unsaturation. This one has, wow, one, two, three, and then the ring. This one has four degrees of unsaturation. That's way too many degrees of unsaturation. And this one only has one. Again, you can also just calculate the formula if you want to. That works perfectly fine as well. All right, formal charge on the indicated atom. To find formal charge, what we're going to do is it's equal to the group number, aka the number of valence electrons on the neutral atom. So oxygen is group six. And then minus. And then we're going to count up the number of bonds. There is one bond. Let's color code this. Now we've got the one bond here plus, and then the number of non-bonding electrons. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six non-bonding electrons. And so this ends up being six minus seven, which is going to equal negative one. And that's always going to be the formal charge on an oxygen when it has one bond and um, three lone pairs on it, or six non-bonding electrons. All right, what's the formal charge on this? Carbon is group four. So four minus, and we've got a triple bond. So we're gonna put a three there, plus, and there are two non-bonding electrons. So four minus five is equal to negative one. And as we'll learn in our acid base unit, and throughout the course, a carbon that has fewer than four bonds is a very, very, very unstable carbon. It's not a happy carbon at all. This is a wildly reactive molecule. More on that later. Okay, up next we have nitrogen, which is group five minus, and there are four bonds, four bonds and zero non-bonding electrons. So this is gonna be positive one. Anytime a nitrogen has four bonds on it, it's going to have a positive one formal charge. All right, we have another one. So nitrogen again is group five minus, there are one, two, three bonds plus, and then two non-bonding electrons. So this actually has a neutral formal charge, zero. Okay, cool. And then we have, sorry, there wasn't much of a variety with these last two. Um, this one has a formal charge equal to five minus, and again, there are three bonds and two non-bonding electrons. So this one's also zero. Great. All right, hybridization and electron domain geometry on each of these. Okay, we get to use one of my favorite rules in chemistry, the sp -b 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 -d -d rule. The sp -b 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 -d -d rule, yeah, the sp -b 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 -d -d rule. What is the sp -b 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 -d -d rule, you might ask. Glad you asked. The way it works is, it's, well, it's fun and easy. We're going to write out sp -p -p -d -d. So I'm going to write out S P P P D D. And the d -d is not necessary. We're not going to see anything that's SP3D hybridized or anything like that. We're only going to invoke um, S orbitals and P orbitals in hybridization in this class. But it's more fun to say sp -b 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 -d -d than it is to say sp -p -p -p. So that's why I write out sp -b 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 -d -d. Okay. So once we have this written, all we have to do is count the number of electron domains. And electron domains are basically, so electron domains, I like to think of them as branches of electrons. So single, double, and triple bonds all count as one electron domain. I'll write that out again. So it doesn't matter if we're looking at a single, double, or triple bond. They all count as one electron domain. And then lone pairs also count as one electron domain each. Uh, if you have an unpaired electron, a radical, then it's also going to count as an electron domain, but we're not going to look at that in this unit. We'll talk about radicals later on the semester. We're not going to worry about that now. So if we're looking at, um, let's start with A. It's a good place to start. Remember, these are skeletal structures. So any atom, I would draw in the sneaky hydrogens that are hidden. Carbon, we assume, is going to make a total of four bonds. So we have on this one, two, three electron domains. Then all we're going to do is go up to the sp -b 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 -da -da and count over one, two, three. 
and voila, we have the hybridization. It is sp2 hybridized. That other p orbital then is available for making a pi bond. And that's why we can see there's a double bond then. It's actually not really a double bond because there's resonance in the system. We'll talk about resonance later in the semester. Um, but anyway, it's got um, a p orbital that I can use for pi electrons. Okay, the other thing that I wanna point out is we're only concerned with electron domain geometry in Chem 202 for right now. So we're not concerned with the molecular geometry. Um, in this case, the molecular geometry is bent. We're not gonna consider that. Basically, if you know the hybridization, you know the electron domain geometry. And there's just three that we need to be familiar with. So let's cover those right now. If something is sp2 hybridized, that means that we're looking at a trigonal planar electron domain geometry. If something is sp hybridized, so just sp, it is going to be linear. An example of an sp hybridized, that's not how you spell linear, it's liner, linear. So this nitrogen, for example, triple bond has one electron domain, the lone pair is one electron domain. So we count over one, two, this is gonna be sp hybridized. And again, that means that we're looking at linear, okay? Whereas sp2 is trigonal planar. The other one that we want to be familiar with is if you have not one, not two, not three, but four electron domains, we're looking at sp3 hybridized, and that is going to be tetrahedral. Tetrahedral geometry. Okay. So now I'm just going to go through and do all of these. All right, choice C has one, two, three electron domains. So choice C is also going to be sp2 hybridized as well. D, now remember there's some sneaky hydrogens. One, two, three hydrogens not depicted. So this one has, wait for it, one, two, three, four electron domains, which means this is sp3 hybridized. Um, e is also sp3 hybridized. And F, there are two sneaky hydrogens in there. So F is just going to be sp2. Okay. All right, we're done with this one. On to the next one. How many stereocenters are on this molecule? Okay, for something to be a stereocenter or an asymmetric center, um, it needs to be, we're only gonna be considering carbons and it needs to be sp3 hybridized. So anything with a double bond on it, we can automatically eliminate and get rid of those. It also needs to have four unique chains coming off of it. Okay, so it doesn't need to be a unique atom. If a chain is different, so let's say you have a carbon and that carbon is bonded to a hydrogen and a chlorine and a carbon and a another carbon. If those carbons are the exact same, so if they're both methyl groups, for example, this would not be an asymmetric center. But if one of them instead was, let's say like an ethyl group, so instead, this was CH2, and then we went to a CH3. Now, even though the carbon is bonded to two different carbons, an ethyl group is different from a methyl group, okay? So if you see something perfectly symmetrical, that's not gonna be a stereocenter. If not, you're likely looking at a stereocenter. So let's get to it and let's count these out. Okay. So this is going to be, one. actually, I'm going to get rid of these so that they don't distract. Okay. Enhance, enhance. This is going to be a stereocenter right here. This is going to be a stereocenter. 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 This, well, that one's not because it's got two hydrogens coming off of it. So Nope, not a stereocenter. 
And then this one right here is going to be a stereocenter as well. It's got one hydrogen and then it's got a methyl group over here. It's got this continuation of a carbon chain over here. And then it's got a continuation of a carbon chain that hits this double bond and a chlorine over here. So this is also going to be in a stereocenter. Okay, great. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Six stereocenters. Stereocenter kind of sounds like a place where you would go buy audio equipment. Okay. Up next, what is the stereogenic configuration of the labeled stereocenter? Okay, well, let's find it out. First thing we need to do is prioritize. So what I'm going to do is number. Okay, first you look at the atoms that it's immediately bonded to. Of these atoms, oxygen has the greatest atomic number. So this is going to be the highest priority. Then we have carbon, carbon, and huh, carbon. Great. So which of these carbons is going to take priority? Well, in order to do that, we need to look downstream of those carbons. So actually, I'm going to color code these as well. Um, OK. So if we look at this carbon here, what is it attached to? It's attached to three hydrogens. OK, it's kind of ho-hum. If we look at this carbon right here, this carbon is attached to, well, it's got a single bond to one carbon, and then it's got a double bond to another carbon. Remember, we count double bonds like it's bonded to two of those particular atoms. So this one is going to be, we're going to count as three carbons that it's bonded to. And then finally, this carbon here is bound to two carbons and a hydrogen. So this one's going to come in third, actually. The benzene ring on the bottom, this is going to be our second substituent. And the methyl group is going to be fourth. Um, generally speaking, if you ever have a hydrogen, that will be lowest priority. If not, a methyl group CH3 is probably going to be the lowest priority. Um, outside of hydrogen. So now what I like to do to figure out stereo, um, the configurations, I like to redraw this as a like little cartoon. So what I mean by that is I'm going to draw basically the same exact skeleton, except no actual atoms bonded to it. Doop, 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 doop. So notice that my wedges are the same, they're oriented the same way. And then I'm just gonna put my numbers on here. So this is priority one. Over here, we have priority three. Down here, we have priority two. And here we have priority four. So at this point, there are three options available to us. If the lowest priority group is going into the page, if it's on that, um, that dash, that means that you can just look at it the way it is and then see how one, two, and three are oriented and reason it to be R or S accordingly. If the lowest priority is not going into the page, which is the case here, we have to do a little bit more work. Some people can actually picture the molecule in 3D and can sort of rotate it around so that the lowest priority they can grab three and twist it around and make one over there and be like, okay, so it's one and then two and then three. So it's going in a counterclockwise, it's S, but that takes a long time to be able to develop that skill. You can build a model if you want to. Models are good ways of representing them. And then you can just look at it and you have something more tangible to work with. Or you can do what I like to call the swoop and swap method, which is kind of fun. And the way the swoop and swap method works is what we're gonna do is basically create the same scaffolding. So I have three and then two are on the plane. And you're gonna switch group four to make it going into the page. So I'm gonna switch groups one and four here. So I'm going to make four going that way. And I'm going to switch one to the wedge. OK, now that four is going back away, I can come up with the configuration. So again, we're going to draw an arrow that goes starts with one and goes around to three. This goes in a um, clockwise direction. 
clockwise corresponds to R. Now remember, we built the stereo isomer of what we had because we took those two and we flipped them around. Whenever you switch two substituents around, you're creating the stereo isomer. And in this case, the stereo isomer would be the enantiomer of what we started with. So we just need to remember that what we actually have is the opposite. This is S configuration. So S is going to be the answer. We're not interested in our imaginary molecule to be created and switched around. That was just used as a tool to figure out what our actual configuration was. Okay. Up next, we have a um, bit of a bonanza of stereochemistry here. We're going to define the absolute configuration on each of these carbons. So this is going to take a little bit of time, but let's do it. This would be good practice here. Okay, I'm going to start with the molecule on the left. And you know what? Well, let's just start at A. It's a good place to start. So if we look at A and we prioritize, we have hydrogen is four, iodine, it's pretty heavy halogen, it's one, fluorine is going to be two, and then finally, um, this extension over here, it's a carbon that is attached to. Carbon is going to be the third priority here. So this is going to be three. The lowest priority is not going into the page, and so I'm going to do the swoop and swap method. So I'm going to swoop and swap one and four. And I'm just going to, again, recreate what we have here, only using numbers instead. So we have three is the continuation of the chain. The fluorine is two. And I've swooped and swapped one and four. OK. So looking at this, this is one, two, three. So this goes around clockwise, which means this is R. So that means that A is going to be the stereo. Um, we're gonna flip the, since we did the flip, we have to remember that A then is going to be S instead, okay? So I'm gonna write that actually right next to the A, just as a reminder, it's gonna help us analyze if these are enantiomers or diastereomers or identical molecules, okay. One down, four to go. Let's do it. Okay. Up next, we have B. Okay. So B, if we're numbering it, we have fluorine is going to be number one. Oxygen is number two. Then we have two carbons. We have a methyl group right here. And then we have a carbon that's attached to an iodine, a fluorine, and a hydrogen. So that carbon is attached to more than just hydrogen. So that's going to take the next priority. So this is going to be three up here. And the methyl group is going to be four. Again, if you don't have a hydrogen, usually methyl is four. Okay. So is the lowest priority going into the page? No, it's not. So I need to do some swooping and some swapping. I'm going to recreate the structure here. So we're going to switch around four and one. It doesn't always have to be four and one that you switch. It just so happens that one for all the examples we've done so far has been the highest priority. Well, one's always the highest priority. It's been one going into the page. Again, you're always just going to switch around four with whatever's going into the page if you have to do the swoop and swap method. This is two and this is three. So looking at this now, one, two, three. So this is an S configuration, which means that the one that we actually started with is R, okay? So this is going to be R on our actual molecule. Okay. In the words of the great poet and philosopher, John Bon Jovi, whoa, we're halfway there. All right, we've got two more to do, so let's do this. Next, we're going to do C, which makes sense. Okay, there's actually two ways that we can kind of think about C. First is the tried and true way. So um, that's what we're gonna do first. And again, if we look at the numbers here, we've got, this is first place, um, the fluorine is second place, the hydrogen is 
fourth place and this chain is third place. Once again, we don't have the lowest priority going into the page. So we have to do a little swoop and swap. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. So swooping and swapping. I'm gonna keep everything other than the swooped, the swoop E and the swappy. So one is still gonna be up here. Three is gonna be here. And we're gonna swoop and swap two and four. We always wanna get four going backwards. Okay, and this is, we moved two over here. So if we look at this then, it goes one, two, and three. So this is in the S configuration, which means that this stereo center is going to be R. So C is R, okay. Now, the other way that we could think about this is if we look at our molecule that we're looking at now versus the first one that we did. So I'm going to get rid of these. Notice that the only two things that we changed were we took the I and the F and we switched the spot of two substituents. If you switch the spot of two and only two substituents, you can reason that you must be looking at um, the opposite stereo configuration. Abs the opposite absolute configuration is what you had before. So since we flipped around, flipped around those two, that means instead of being S, which this one was, this is R. If you switch around three or four though, you can't do this unless you reason what's happening in space because then it's not a guarantee. But if you flip two and only two substituents around, then you can boldly but accurately claim that you've made the opposite stereo center. So you can't go wrong though with finding the absolute configuration using the methods that we're using. But this is a kind of quick way that you can kind of check your work as well. Okay, and now let's do the last one. So D, we've got Chlorine is one, oxygen is two. The continuation of the chain is three and the methyl is four. Once again, we have to do some scooping and some swapping. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is recreate. This is one, three, we're not gonna do anything with those. And then, this is four, and this is gonna be two. So looking at this, all right, one, two, three. So it goes around like this. So this is R, which means that our actual stereo center must be S. So D is S. Okay. And now the last part of the question is, how are these two molecules related to each other? So if we look at the first one, the first one, A is S and B is R. So I'm just gonna write this out. So this is S and R. Whereas on our second molecule, it is R and S. Okay, so we've changed the stereochemical identity at both carbons, at both stereo centers. Anytime you change all of the stereo centers from R to S or S to R, you are looking at the enantiomer unless it's a perfectly symmetrical molecule and then you have these things called meso compounds, but we're not gonna deal with that in this class. So if you flip all stereo centers, then you get the enantiomer. If you flip some, but not all, but not all, then you get, actually I shouldn't have put that in parentheses, it's important, I'll put the stars next to it instead. Then you have the diastereomers. 
And then finally, if all are the same, it means that you're looking at the same molecule. And remember, just because something looks different, um, these molecules have free rotation about them. So there are multiple ways of drawing it in S versus R. So don't assume just because something looks different that it must automatically be different, okay? But by looking at the stereo center and its absolute configuration, you can always find out what you're looking at. If it's an enantiomer, a diastereomer are the same molecule. And in this case, again, we flipped both of the stereo centers. So we're looking at the enantiomer, okay? Um, the other thing I want to note is this applies for um, any number of stereo centers. So if you have like three stereo centers and it's S, S, and S, then the enantiomer would be R, R, and R. Um, a diastereomer of S, S, S would be like S, S, R, R, S, R, S, R, R, S, S. Again, flipping all of them gets you the enantiomer, flipping only, um, not flipping any number other than all of them gets you the diastereomer. And we'll take actually a closer look at that in just a moment. Okay, and then finally, we want to determine um, the partial charge on each of these. Okay, so what we're going to do is remember charge flocks more toward electronegative atoms. If you ever have a carbon hydrogen bond, those are neutral, they share their charge very evenly. If you ever have something bound to itself, like say a carbon carbon bond, or a hydrogen hydrogen bond, or heck, a chlorine chlorine bond. Anything bonded to itself is also going to be neutral. For our purposes, anytime you have two atoms that are unique atoms bonded to each other that aren't carbon and hydrogen, there's going to be a charge differential. You're going to have a partial positive or partial negative. So going through here, hydrogen bound to oxygen. The oxygen is going to pull electron density away from the hydrogen. So the hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. And the oxygen is going to get a partial negative charge by a result of the electron density coming toward it. Same thing with this oxygen up here. Four is a carbon-carbon bond slash carbon-hydrogen bonds. So four is just going to be neutral, no charge. Then if we look at carbon chlorine bond, the chlorine is going to pull electron density away from the carbon. So the chlorine is going to have a partial negative charge and the carbon is going to have a partial positive charge. Okay. And now we're at the free response portion. Um, so the way I cut this off, I cut off the top of the question. Um, the first part is just going to be naming these molecules. Okay. So the first step in naming is to find the longest contiguous chain. And for this first one, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons in our longest chain. Remember also that we need to make sure that our longest chain um, includes any um, pertinent functional groups, um, so like the nitro group there, or the fluorine. Now then, so step one, this has eight carbons. So this is going to have a parent name. This is going to have a parent name. Of octane. Okay. Now then, when numbering, which direction do we number? Well, if we start, let's actually just get super enhanced here. If we start from here, it takes us one, two carbons to get to a functional group. Well, why do that, or to get to a substituent rather? Why number that way when we could instead number this way, where right off the bat at position one, we have a substituent. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Great, now we have the numbering. We're getting there. Now we need to assign names to each of these. So this is a nitro group, okay? This right here, it's got four carbons in it. And notice that it splits at the end. Anytime you have three carbons and a substituent that split at the end or four carbons that split at the end, you're looking at an iso group. 
So this is isobutyl on account of the four carbons. Again, it kind of looks like a peace sign. We have a methyl group here. And then we have a fluoro, note, not fluoro, fluoro right here. Okay, so then when alphabetizing these, and I'm gonna put the numbers in here too. So it's one nitro, um, four isobutyl, five methyl, and seven fluoro. When alphabetizing, you do N versus I versus M versus F. So putting these in order, um, alphabetical order, A, B, C, D, E, F comes first. So I'm just gonna put parentheses one. I like to offset with parentheses to um, remind myself what order they're gonna come in in the actual name. This is gonna be two. M comes before N, so this is gonna be three. And then finally, this is going to be four. So the full name then is going to be Okay, one fluoro, four isobutyl, five methyl, and sorry, not one fluoro, seven fluoro, on account of it being at the seven position, um, and then one nitro octane. Seven fluoro, four isobutyl, five methyl, one nitro octane. Woo. Okay. Up next, we have this molecule. Ooh, we have a cyclic molecule. Fun. So we're going to, ooh, and it's a cyclic alkene. All right. So whenever we have a alkene, we want to number it so that we are getting to the double bond as quickly as possible. So here is our parent chain right here. And when numbering it, we're going to start by numbering right here at this carbon. So if you ever have a cyclic alkene, you always put carbon one as part of the alkene. And you always have to number through the double bond. So we can't go then up and to the right. We have to go through the double bond. It's going to be one, two. And I wanted to note that the reason why I'm numbering it this way, so this is three, four, five and six. The reason why I'm numbering it that way as opposed to the other way is if I started with this position being one, then um, our substituents wouldn't be minimized because um, that propyl group would be coming off of carbon two instead of carbon one. So we're combining that other element of nomenclature here. So the parent name for this molecule is going to be Cyclo hex for the six carbons, and then one ene. We always have to give a locant for a double bond or a triple bond. We could also call this one cyclohexene instead. I always prefer to just put the locant right before the ene or the yne for an alkene or an alkyne, respectively. Okay, so then looking at our functional groups. We have five isopropyl, that's this fellow right here. We have three chloro, and we have one, and it looks to be a regular propyl. So when alphabetizing these, remember I is the only prefix that we will include when alphabetizing. So I versus C versus is P. So putting these in order then, um, C is going to come first, then I, then P. So our full name for this molecule is going to be do, 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 three chloro, five isopropyl, one propyl. And we'll jump into the parent name, cyclohex1ene. Again, I could also call it um, 
three chloro, five isopropyl, one propyl, one cyclohexene, but I just prefer to include that one right before the E and E. I think it's a little bit more straightforward. Okay, so we've got one more left to do. Let's do this. All right, so looking here at our longest chain, it's gonna be this right here. And when numbering, just note, triple bonds are always going to be linear and they can look a little bit funny. So make sure when you number these, just be cognizant of the fact that, so we want to minimize the triple bond so we can come from this direction, one, two, and then we get to the triple bond at three. Um, if we went the other direction, we get to it at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is gonna be the way to minimize the number on the alkyne. This is four, this is five, this is six, this is seven, this is eight, this is nine, this is 10. Enhance, enhance, enhance. Anytime you see something like this, a common mistake is thinking this is only two carbons. It's not. So this is one, two, three, four carbons. Wherever the triple bond is, there's a carbon on the left and the right hand side of that, okay? So this is two carbons connected together with a triple bond. Just make sure, just wanna point that out. So, okay. Now then, our parent name for this molecule is going to be, let's see, DEC on account of the 10, and it's gonna be DEC three, so deck three ein is going to be our parent name. In terms of our substituents, in terms of substituents, we have this group right here. So there are four carbons. And this is a, um, whenever it comes off of the second carbon right here, this is a sec butyl that we're looking at. So six sec butyl. And with sec butyl, you'll sometimes see it written in parentheses because the sec modifies the um, side chain out the parent chain. So you can put it in parentheses if you want to, it's not necessary though. We have a nine methyl group and we have a five ethyl group and we have um, a two bromo group. Okay, so it's B versus E versus B versus M. So for B, we need to use BR versus BU. Go to the second letter for the tiebreaker. So bromo is going to be first in our name, then secbutyl, then ethyl, and then methyl. So the full name of this molecule is going to be, okay, two bromo, Great, six sec butyl, cool, five ethyl, nine methyl, and then right into the parent name, deck three ein. 2-bromo, 6-sec-butyl, 5-ethyl, 9-methyl, DEC-3-ine, or you could call it 2-bromo, 6-sec-butyl, 5-ethyl, 9-methyl, 3-deckine. Either one works, but I like to put the 3 right before the Y and E. Okay, we did it. Now then, the next part is drawing molecules. And I liked the drawing molecules because if you can name a molecule, drawing is a piece of cake because we actually give you the whole scaffolding here. You just need to kind of recreate it. And the way that I like to start these, focus on the parent. So this is undec 2 en I'm gonna start by drawing, the DEC means that, um, or sorry, the undec, excuse me, means that there are 11 carbons. So this is also a cis alkene. And notice that the alkene is at the two spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by drawing a cis double bond. So I've got carbon one and then two three, and the rest of the molecule I can just do a zigzag. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. 
I'm going to number. Numbering makes it really, really nice for your scaffolding here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. At this point, we've done most of the work. We just need to make sure that we're putting the substituents where they go. And something that I like to do that helps me with these is I like to put little checks um, as I go through. So I drew the undekin part. I took care of the cis. And now I'm just gonna go through and take care of the rest of these. So five turt butyl. I'm gonna go to five and the turt butyl kind of looks like a T. It's like that, or kind of looks like a chicken foot kind of. That's taken care of. Six isopropyl. Isopropyl looks like a Mercedes Benz sign or a peace sign. That's taken care of. And then nine nitro. Nitro is just an NO2. That's taken care of. So let's see. Um, everything is good. We're done. That's all we have to do here. All right, the next one is a cyclohexane. So I'm going to look at the parent first. I'm going to draw out my. I'm going to number. Doesn't matter where I start, everything else will fall into place. So this is going to be one, two, three, four. I don't know why I'm so zoomed out. Five, six. I guess it was to see the entire name. Okay, great. So my cyclohexane is done. One chloro, I can do that. Cl. Three isobutyl. Okay, so off the three, an isobutyl is one, two, three, four carbons, ends in a peace sign. And then five propyl, one, two, three carbons on a propyl. One chloro, three isobutyl, five propyl cyclohexane. Cool. Okay, up next we have bun with structures. For each of the following jala molecule with a given formula that has each of um, the names, the way that I like to go about doing these is um, I like to start by drawing the functional group in question. So this says an ester. An ester is when you have a um, two carbon chains on both sides of an oxygen, but the one carbon has a double bonded oxygen coming off of it. So, um, and this needs to be a carbon afterwards. If it was a hydrogen, it would be a carboxylic acid. So there I have my scaffolding. I've got one, two carbons taken care of, and I've got, let's see, three left to go. So it doesn't matter how I make this, how I make my ester, I'm just gonna go one, two, three. So let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. Great. We'll learn about naming esters later in the semester. Esters are really fun because based off of what you have on each side of the oxygen, you get very different smells from them. They're really, really cool. Okay. Now then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of hydrogens I have right now and see if that matches what I'm trying to get. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Oh, well, yeah, and this one's good to go. I don't need to do any modifications to it. So this one's good as is, cool. What about the next one? C6H11N that contains an amine. Again, I'm gonna start by drawing an amine. So amine, I can make it secondary or tertiary if I want to, I'm just gonna make it primary. So NH2, you know what, let's just draw, let's just draw the bonds on this. And you know what, for posterity's sake, I'm gonna add lone pairs to my top molecule and to this one right here. Okay, so I have my amine. It's gonna be single bonded to a carbon, check. And then let's see, how many carbons do I have total? Six, so one, two, three, four, five, and six. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then our amine, cool. Now then let's count the number of hydrogens. I think we'll see that this time it does not match. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then 14 and 15. 
Does that match what we want? Well, we want 11. So no, no, it does not. Oh no, whatever shall we do? We can add in double bonds or triple bond to help take care of some of these hydrogens. Every double bond you add adds a degree of unsaturation. Every ring you add adds a degree of unsaturation. A degree of unsaturation is just two hydrogens. Um, every triple bond actually takes care of two degrees of unsaturation. Um, we also give you the formula for degrees of unsaturation. So if you want to consult that, you're welcome to use that and then it's gonna kind of help you catalyze this process. But the way that I like to do it is um, I like to draw it out and then just take care of some hydrogen. So I'm gonna put a double bond here. That's gonna take care of two hydrogens. Um, I'm just gonna clean up the structure a little bit. So now I've got only one hydrogen on each of these. And then I'm gonna add in actually another double bond. Again, there's multiple ways, right ways that I could go about doing this. That'll take care of two hydrogens. And I'm just gonna clean up the structure a little bit to make it match the actual geometry that we would see around here. Okay, now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 hydrogens. Great, this matches the formula. I'm good to go. Other ways that I could have done this with degrees of unsaturation, I could make a cyclic structure and add in a double bond and then make it an NH2. Um, I could make a triple bond. So that's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, and then an NH2 coming off of it. Um, there's a lot of right ways that I could go about doing this. I just chose to do two double bonds because that just felt like the simplest way. Okay. And the final question. It's the final question. Do -do -do. Do -do -do -do. Let's do, -do, do this question. Stereochemistry, drawing enantiomers and diastereomers. We are looking at one chloro, three methyl cyclohexane. It's got four stereoisomers, count them four. One R, three R, one R, three S, one S, three R, and one S, three S. We want to draw them all out and find their relationships with each other. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a life hack here. The easiest way to go about doing this problem is first draw the molecule the easiest possible way. And what I mean by that is, so here is our um, cyclohexane ring. What I'm going to do is put the lowest priority group going into the page. And I'm gonna see what that gives me. And I'm gonna base the rest of my answers just off of that. That makes this really, 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 really quick to do. So before I put anything into the boxes here, I always like to start by In this case, the lowest priority group is gonna be hydrogen for both of these. So a hydrogen there and a hydrogen there. So I'm gonna put the chlorine coming out of the page here. And I'm gonna put the methyl coming out of the page right here. Now I'm gonna find what the configuration is at both of these sites. So chlorine is one. Um, if we're looking at this carbon versus this carbon, well, they're both carbons with two hydrogens, so we need to move onward. So we check that carbon versus this carbon. The bottom carbon has two carbons that's attached to. Um, the upper root only has um, but one downstream. So this is going to win. This is going to be priority two. This is going to be priority three. And again, by putting the hydrogen in the back, well, we know hydrogen is four. Now then, I'm going to see what this is and I'm going to then base my answers off of this. So one, two, three, it goes around like this. Goes around, goes around. Um, so this is R, great. Okay, and now I'm going to do the other one. So the way this is drawn, this is R looking at this one down here. Um, so hydrogen again is gonna be four. Um, if we're comparing CH3 versus these two carbons, we need to keep moving downstream. The one that's attached to the chlorine is going to get the next priority in terms of that chain. So this is one, this is gonna be two, and this is gonna be three. 
So one, two, three. This is S. The way I, I actually like to think about S is when you draw it, it's kind of like you're drawing an S. So I start by doing that and then I could continue and make it an S. So it's like the top of an S when you go around. Anyway, just a way that I like to think about it. But again, whenever you look at one, two, and three, and you have a um, counterclockwise um, circle, that means you're looking at S configuration. So the way that this is drawn is, let's clean this up a little bit. The R group, um, the R group, the chloro group is in its R configuration. The methyl group is in the S configuration. So I just drew the 1R3S. Now all I'm gonna do is plug this in to the one that matches. So again, this is the, the one that I drew is 1R3S. So which of these matches? Um, 1R3S. So it's gonna be this one right here. I'm just going to recreate what I just drew in here. So this is Cl. This is hydrogen. Okay, great. And this is going to be the CH3. And this is hydrogen. We've basically done all the work now because if I wanna draw the 1R3R, I'm going to make this stereo center the exact same as this one because I want it to still be R. So C, L, and H. And then the other stereo center, I'm just going to flip around to make sure, since this is 3S, I want it to be R. I'm going to make this the hydrogen and this the CH3. Okay. If I want to make the 1S 3R, 1. So 1S3R is completely switched from my reference one. So I'm gonna put a hydrogen and a chlorine and I'm going to put a hydrogen and the CH3 like so. And finally the 1S3S, the way that I'm going to make that is I'm going to make sure that the 3S stays intact. So that's hydrogen, this is CH3. And then I'm going to flip the stereo center. So that's going to be a hydrogen and that's going to be a chlorine. So then it went from 1R to 1S. So again, the easiest way of doing that's not a very good looking chlorine. The easiest way of doing this is make a demo molecule where the lowest priority, in this case, the hydrogens are going into the page. It makes our job easier than to figure out the configuration on our demo molecule, I'll call it. Then just see which one, which box that matches. You can then base all of your other answers off of that. Okay, so the last thing that we wanna do is, um, we want to indicate, I cut it off from this page, but we wanna know which ones are diastereomers and which ones are enantiomers of each other. So going off of a rule that I said before, so which ones are diastereomers and which ones are enantiomers? Enantiomers are going to be ones where we flip every single stereo center. So the enantiomers here are going to be, I'll just put a little E here, um, 1R, 1S, or sorry, 1R, 3S. And 1S, 3R. So these are enantiomers of each other. Remember, enantiomers are a relationship. It's not saying that those molecules exclusively are the only ones that can be enantiomers because if we look at 1R, 3R and 1S, 3S, those are also both completely flipped. So 1R, 3R and 1S, 3S are enantiomers of each other. In terms of diastereomers, diastereomers are where we flip 
um, all but one. I'm um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Let me take that back. Diastereomers are where we flip at least one stereo center, but not all of them. So what I mean by that is if we look at 1R, 3R, the way that we would get the diastereomers of 1R, 3R would be we change either the first R to an S or the 3R to 3S, but not both. So 1R, 3R, its diastereomer would be 1R, 3S. So these two are diastereomers of each other. And also 1R, 3R, the other way I can make a diastereomer is if I made it 1S and 3R. So these are diastereomers of each other. But wait, there's more. If we look at this molecule down here, the 1S, 3S, so 1S and 3S is going to be a diastereomer of 1R, 3S. So these are diastereomers of each other. And it's also going to be a diastereomer of the 1S, 3R. So 1S, 3S, and 1R, oh, sorry, 1S, 3R. Okay, and then all the other ones I already have accounted for. So like the diastereomers of 1S, 3R, R, 1R, 3R, and 1S, 3S, but I've already accounted for those relationships. Same thing with the 1R, 3S. I've already accounted for all of its diastereomers. This will always be the case if you have two stereocenters um, and a, an asymmetrical molecule. There will always be four uh, diastereomers and, or, sorry, four pairs, because again, this is a relationship. So there'll be four pairs of diastereomers and two pairs of enantiomers that you would get from this. Okay, and that concludes our practice exam. So thank you all for joining. If you felt comfortable going through this, you should do really, really, really ridiculously well on the actual exam. So keep up the hard work and dominate the exam.